Hello all and welcome to Seeing the Invisible, the pitfalls of the pit count. My name is Kayla Kennington and I am the Education and Engagement Manager at Family Promise National and I will be assisting as your moderator today. To begin, I would like to briefly go over some quick housekeeping reminders. Um, all of our attendees are on mute, um, so please feel free to use the Q&A box to submit your questions and we will be addressing questions at the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar um, and we'll be sharing it out after uh, for anyone who missed it or wanted to go back. So today we are joined by three great presenters. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Klaus Ehlers, who is the CEO of Family Promise National. We're also joined by Kenyal Braswell, who is a Family Promise Guest Advisory Council member, <clears throat> excuse me, and a graduate of Family Promise of Davie County. And last but not least, uh, we are also joined by Lisa Foster, who is the Executive Director of Family Promise of Davie County. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. So briefly, just to go over what we will be covering, um, today you'll be learning the difference between the public perception of family homelessness and the reality of the crisis, the true definition of homelessness, and also the fate of and options for families who fail to meet HUD's definition of homelessness. And on that note, I will go ahead and turn um, the mic over to Klaus. Kayla, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're going to be taking about a half hour today. We definitely want to leave some time for question you know, Q&A, but we want to give a quick overview. And so uh, the pit count, right, is the point in time count. And there is a, a basic maxim that says you cannot manage what you can't measure. So when you're talking about homelessness, the question is, how do you measure homelessness? And the challenge with this is, of course, there's a lot of different ways to look at that because how, what, why, who, depends on your perspective. And I think there's sort of two ways to look at homelessness. One is that it's a political problem, something that we want to solve. And another is that it's a manifestation of poverty and thus is systemic and needs a much more encompassing uh, sort of a way to be addressed. And the challenge is that the point in time count is designed really to address the political problem. But the political problem is that you have people experiencing homelessness who are sleeping um, on streets in front of, of stores, on subways, and encampments by highways, and so on. Of course, you have families, you have many others as well, too. But the visible people experiencing homelessness become the political problem that has really driven most of our approach. And I don't want to be too sweeping because everybody involved, everybody had cares tremendously about everybody experiencing homelessness. But the reality is we set up to measure homelessness really through the lens of what is visible those people who are experiencing homelessness in a visible way. And um, this leads to a lot of challenges when it comes to addressing family homelessness, because for families, we really need to take the approach that says, homelessness is a manifestation of systemic issues of poverty and thus need to be addressed in a more holistic way. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Foster, our amazing executive director in Davie County, to talk a bit more about the mechanics of the pit count. Awesome. Yeah, so um, the point in time count, um, it is an annual survey of people experiencing homelessness, and this happens on a single night in January, um, typically in the last um, 10 days of that month. And what you're counting, what is determined to be homeless is people living in shelters, individuals living in transitional housing type programs, and individuals living on the street. So those are the definitions or the categories that HUD determines to be homeless. Um, and what it doesn't include are people that are living with families and friends. So doubled up multiple households in one home, um, people staying in vehicles, people staying in motels or just other spaces that aren't theirs. Um, so that's the big difference between what you know HUD determines um, what is homeless and what's not. Okay, let's you want to get to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the point of the count is not only to capture the number of people experiencing homelessness, but also um, what that looks like. So how many people are families? How many are chronically homeless? How many are disabled? All of those types of things. That are, those are other categories that this count um, captures. But um, the counts are led by local volunteers within 
communities continuums of care. Um, and like I said, they're counting every year people that are in shelter and transitional housing programs. And every other year, the count captures people that are unsheltered. Um, I do think most counties do the unsheltered count every year, but it's te technically only required every other year. Um, but the big thing to take away is that the point in time count, it really is just a snapshot. It's not getting the whole picture because we are losing a whole segment of the population that um, is typically families with kids that are, you know, living in those motels, staying with friends and families or bouncing around um, to different places. Um, and I think where I'm from, the community I work in is a really good example of this. So I'm in Davie County, North Carolina, and we're a really rural community. And we are the only shelter in our county. So there's no other um, shelter providers. So when we turn in our numbers for our annual point in time count, the only numbers getting captured for our entire county are the ones that I submit for our shelter, um, which is, you know, a relatively small number. Um, and before we opened our affiliate five years ago, our community, our county was not participating in the point in time count at any consistency. So for many years, it would look like on paper that our county had no one experiencing homelessness, which we know is not true because homelessness exists everywhere. So I do think there are probably other communities very similar to ours that are being really underrepresented and undercounted. So you can go to the next slide. Um, but what this count does show us is that homelessness has been on the rise for the fourth consecutive year. Um, from 2019 to 2020, it increased by 2%. Um, and we see that of the total number of people that are considered to be homeless, 172,000 of those are families with children. And that's 30% of people experiencing homelessness are families. Um, and 90% of children that are captured on that count are in shelters. They're not, um, they're not finding as many on, you know, living in the street or unsheltered homelessness. Um, but these statistics, like we've said, are incomplete and they really are undercounting the full extent of homelessness and the full um, picture of family homelessness specifically. Um, and one other thing to point out is that the data we have, you know, from 2020 is from January of 2020, which is pre-pandemic, pre-COVID. And we know COVID has really exacerbated a lot of crises and homelessness is one of them. So we really won't see the true impact of COVID for another, you know, possibly year or more. Um, but I want to introduce Kenyelle Braswell, who is, um, she's the mother of the first family that our affiliate ever served in, um, in shelter. And her, she's going to share a bit about her story. And um, it's a really good example of, you know, families that might go under um, counted in the point in time count. So Kenyelle, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kenyelle Braswell. And um, 2017, me and my children were um, in, were homeless. Um, I went through a divorce and um, at the time we were kind of going from county to county until we stayed with my sister. Um, but she was actually living in subsidized housing and their rules are, you know, you can't really have anyone there after a certain amount of time um, if they're not on the lease. So us being there really kind of almost jeopardized her housing. So um, I heard about family, family promise through a friend and I met this um, awesome lady named Lisa Foster and we kind of went through the process together. Um, whenever I first got there, me and my kids literally had a few suitcases. Nothing was really attached to our name at the moment. So family promise really helped us get in section eight, you know, get my kids in daycare, um, me in school, get, you know, when the time came, got, you know, a good housing to live in, got proper transportation, like they really helped us get back on our feet. And um, we, we did go through different shelters, well, not shelters, but different churches. And so um, now I think of Davie County as my second home because we've been everywhere in Davie County and they've just been really awesome with us. So that's a little bit about my experience with Family Promise and truly without them, it, it would have been a very a much harder 
or a very difficult future, but with them, it was, it's been awesome. And they still help me to this day. It's uh, one of the main reasons why I'm actually on the guest advisory council. So it's, um, it, was a, it was a great experience, very different, but a very great experience. I'm blessed to have had them. And, you know, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll emphasize just to underscore Kenyel's points is that uh, during various times of her experience, HUD would not have considered her homeless, right? When she was doubled up, she was staying in a motel. Uh, it would only be if she was in shelter or if she was um, in, you know, in a, in a place not, not fit for, uh, you know, for people to live in that she would be considered homeless. And, and you can imagine over the course of one month, somebody, a family can easily experience all four of those circumstances. So it's just a question of when you count. And I think when you count is also a really important question because remember when the point in time count is done. It's the last week of January, typically. So of course, do you expect, you know, when would you expect to see more people experiencing homelessness actually out on the streets in the end of January or in milder weather? Uh, that's, I think, another one of the, the real pitfalls about the point in time count. So you know, it's interesting, the 2021 AHAR, the, the count has come out and it's actually showing a decrease theoretically in uh, family homelessness, um, but we had COVID. So less than half of, of COCs of continuums of care could actually even do the count of unsheltered individuals. Um, and with COVID, we know that there are a lot of people that um, are doubled up, uh, you know, that are not going to be out in, in, in shelter because of the limits that you can have on number of people in congregate shelter. And with such an impairment in the ability to count, we really don't know, right? Going back to you have to, you can only manage what you measure. HUD is even less able to measure homelessness now than it ever has been. So the various things that come out about how homelessness is going have to be looked at a little bit sideways because we don't really know. But what we do know is and what family promises has done and what lisa will talk about doing in davie county is um with the advent of COVID, it became obvious that we could no longer offer shelter the same extent that we had before unfortunately we had already been starting to turn our programming towards a more holistic approach how do we keep people in their housing how do we keep them out of shelter and keeping people in the housing is called prevention uh, it, you know it is rental assistance various ways to help families stay in the housing they already have. One of the things we saw nationally is from 2019 to 2000, excuse me, 2020 to 2021, we went from 10,000 people in, uh, fewer than 10,000 people in our programs for prevention to more than 28,000. Uh, and that is a really important outcome because we need to address family homelessness in all of its ways. And even if HUD does not think that the doubled up family or the family staying in a motel is homeless, we do, and we want to have a full array of tools to use to keep them from experiencing homelessness. And prevention is one of the most important ones. And I'll let Lisa, we'll move to the next slide, and Lisa can talk a little bit more about the specifics of how she's run that program in Davie County. Thanks, yeah. So um, prevention, just generally, every, um, you know, every prevention program is going to look a little bit differently, but for the most part across the board prevention the goal of that is to avoid you know imminent loss of housing and to keep families stable in the home that they're in um, and this could look like mediating with landlords to get extensions um, it could be short-term financial assistance assistance for rent utilities um, house related things um, but it could also be case management and connecting people with financial literacy classes or good tenancy classes, um, credit repair, things like that. Um, so those are some of the, the details about prevention that, like I said, are going to look differently everywhere. But um, two things that are pretty consistent is that prevention programs spare families from trauma. Um, I always say that it doesn't matter how great our staff, volunteers, and facilities are, entering shelter is traumatic no matter what. Um, and so if we can prevent a family from getting evicted or losing their home in the first place, then we should be putting all of our, you know, doing as much as we can to make that a priority and make that happen. Um, and it's also more cost effective than shelter. We typically find that um, the amount that is needed to prevent a family from um, eviction is far less than it is to bring a family into shelter or to rehouse them and pay move-in costs. Um, so those are two, you know, big reasons to 
put an emphasis on prevention programming. Um, but for us here in Davie County, we started our prevention program in 2018 through the Help Us Move In grant. And um, currently 42% of the families we serve are through prevention. So it's a huge program for us. Um, and within the year that we added it, um, it quadrupled the amount of people that we were serving, which is mind blowing. Um, just the amount of need there was in our community, but also the, the impact that our affiliate could have um, and just all of the people that we weren't reaching before because we didn't have um, prevention funding and a prevention program. Um, but for us, we focus primarily on past due rent because we do have some other agencies in our community that will do utilities. And so we try to um, only do those types of things if all other agencies, you know, cannot for whatever reason. But for us, on average, it's costing about $800 to prevent a family from experiencing homelessness. Um, that has increased a bit because of, um, I think, because of COVID, um, but it's still much less than it cost for us to bring a family into shelter. Um, and like I said, it has just made a really huge impact on what we are able to do in Davie County and how we're able to not only just do this program by ourselves, but partner with other agencies and serve other families that, you know, we really never would have had maybe contact with, but that is what we are doing in Davie County with prevention. Well, thank you all so much for sharing all of that. That was really helpful. Um, and now we will go ahead and get into some questions. Um, so this is a good question for um, you, Lisa. Um, what sort of resources do you need to offer a prevention program? Um, well, the, the main one is funding for sure. Um, to, to be able to provide that direct financial assistance um, because that's you know the bulk of what we're doing is that direct financial assistance to either the landlord or the utility company. So I'm um, finding you know funding streams to do that. Um, but also you know aside from that is having those like case management tools to go along with the funding because what we know is you know money alone doesn't solve all of these issues. And so having um, the resources to um, get pass along to people is also what's needed. Thank you, that's great. Um, okay, Klaus, I have a question for you. Um, why is HUD the only agency that counts homelessness in this manner? So that's a really good question. Um, for perspective on that, there's a number of agencies that have an interest in homelessness, right? Health and Human Services, Department of Education, Veterans Affairs, we can think of, of all the different agencies that are impacted by homelessness. Um, they all count it in different ways. Overwhelmingly, the other agencies, the Department of Education is a great example, will count it with a more elastic definition, right? Because from the perspective of the Department of Education, it's really important to know that a child is at risk of homelessness, that they're experiencing homelessness, um, that they're unstably housed. So if a child is going to school and they're having different addresses, their addresses in a motel, whatever it might be, there are people charged at those school districts to identify that child and make sure that they get the resources they need so they can have continuity of education and the support that they need. Uh, so when the Department of Education counts, you end up with statistics like one out of 19 children in this country experiences homelessness in some form or other by the time they graduate to the first grade. Really powerful statistic and very different than what you hear from HUD. In terms of the reasons for it, um, again, I wanna be generous. I think that, you know, that, that, that we're products of various systems and pressures and so on, but ultimately, uh, if you limit what you define as the problem and you are charged with solving that problem, you're going to have greater success and you're gonna be able to allocate resources. And I think people would make the argument, and this is certainly a fair argument that, you know, a person um, on the street and on a 10 degree night sleeping on, you know, on a grate on a 10 degree night is somebody in dire need of services and supports and thus is prioritized. And so we do our counting so that we're identifying those people. But there are studies that show that um, in some cities, uh, up to 50% of the people like that person experience homelessness as children. So again, it goes back to looking at this as a systemic issue, a manifestation of poverty, and really trying to get our arms around the entirety of the issue and addressing it holistically rather than just sort of you know, picking the very 
most extreme elements of homelessness to define as homelessness and then sort of kind of create a little fence around that and ignore this large territory of so many other people at risk of falling to exactly those forms or suffering greatly uh, without being that person sleeping on the street. Thank you so much. That, that's really a helpful answer. Um, I have another question for you, Lisa. Um, do you think that the increase in the need for prevention services that you've seen at your affiliate will continue once um, we finally moved past the COVID crisis? I think it will. Um, we were seeing an increase in need for prevention long before COVID ever um, was, you know, on our radar. It definitely exacerbated things, but um, we saw a big increase for that. So I do imagine that it will continue um, to be a need, especially because, you know, in our community, we've seen rental increases, you know, 15 to 20 percent, um, but income has not changed to reflect that. So I think it is going to be an ongoing issue that we're going to see. Thank you. Um, and then as a follow-up just about your prevention program, um, we have a question about if you had to hire additional staff to manage that program. When we launched it in 2018, we did not. We had um, one full-time staff person, which was me, and we had a part-time case manager who was doing all of the things. Um, and so we launched it, you know, just with that number of staff people. And as it has grown over the years, we do have an additional full-time staff person now, but um, we still primarily manage our prevention and diversion programs with um, our part-time person. Um, but we do fill in, you know, um, on the days she's not here. But I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is you can launch a program and it doesn't have to be, you know, full force or as big as, you know, an affiliate or another program that's been doing it for five years. You can start slow and, and add staff along the way. And that's that's what we did. And we've increased the number of people we serve annually because we do have more time to de dedicate to it now. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, OK, so I think this would be a good question for you, Klaus. Um, has HUD said anything about the accuracy of their recent numbers due to the pandemic? Um, I would assume it would be more difficult to track families that are not technically homeless with COVID creating barriers to finding families that are not housed. Yes, uh, I'm actually, uh, so um, in their official press release about the um, annual homeless assessment report, the AHAR, uh, they do have the line here, um, Estimates of the number of people experiencing sheltered homelessness at a point in time in 2021 should be viewed with caution as the number could be artificially depressed compared with non-pandemic times. So yes, there is that recognition that uh, there are a lot of externalities that are affecting um, how we're counting people this year, um, and, you know, how we, counted, excuse me, how we counted people in 2021. So yes, uh, HUD is cognizant of that. And I think that, you know, I think uh, Secretary Fudge is a, an outstanding um, cabinet secretary, I think she has really great priorities on homelessness and has done a great job. I think Jeff Olivet, who has been brought in as the head of the uh, U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, you know, the homelessness czar has a long history of working in family homelessness. So I am optimistic that HUD is going to start taking a more realistic approach to family homelessness and giving it more priority. And we saw a lot of that in the housing legislation that was proposed in Build Back Better as well. Thank you. Um, and sort of as a follow up to that, I think this would be a great question for um, either class or Lisa, but if the official pit count isn't a complete picture of homelessness, how do you get a more accurate count? How can you count all of those who aren't included in the pit count? Um, I think using the Department of Education numbers really helps a lot. Um, I think that you're not, you know, it, it, you're not going to get a hundred percent accurate count, and we need to apply solutions with what we understand roughly the amount of homelessness to be. We don't need to have the exact number. Uh, the Department of Education is pretty accurate, and you can make some extrapolations out of that for children under the age of five because your various uh, sort of actuarial tables that tell you, you know, what what the percentage of younger children would be based on the number of children in schools that are experiencing homelessness. So. We really like to use the Department of Education numbers. You also have numbers in terms of the number of families that are rent burdened, paying more than 50% of their rent, 50% uh, of their income on rent, uh, and other factors as well, too, that give us a, a pretty accurate picture of at least the extent and the enormity of the issue. And that's part of the challenge. It is such an enormous issue 
that um, solutions have to be systemic. Unfortunately, you cannot do it through little patchworks. I don't know, Lisa, if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I was going to say that the school also, we, for local numbers, we work a lot with our um, school systems McKinney Vento liaison to get our numbers. Um, and whenever we're doing, you know, presentations about it, I always, I'll, sh you know, share both um, the Department of Education's number and HUD and kind of use it as a um, educational tool, but we rely a lot on the school system to get our data. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, Kenya, we have a question for you. Um, aside from financial considerations, what were the most valuable services that Family Promise offered to you and your family? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say the, the most valuable was being able to, I got credit consultations. Um, I was able to get information about school and what's the best path. Um, other than them giving, you know, just fi financials, I think that would be the best because they, at Family Promise, they really understood that the whole family need to get taken care of. And, you know, if mom couldn't really get nothing done, then, you know, the kids couldn't get nothing done. So um, we personally made sure that my credit was great for, you know, doing housing and that I was having some type of um, education and that I did understand, you know, what Section 8 is and how it worked. So um, aside from that, you know, getting the information from them and being able to have that support um, was probably the most valuable. Thank you so much. That's that's great to hear. Um, Lisa, a question for you. Um, are there any volunteer opportunities for helping to support a prevention program? Yeah, I think there definitely are. Right now, we don't have tons of volunteer um, interaction in our program, but it is something that I want to, you know, move in the direction of. But I think you could definitely have volunteers once they've gone through, you know, the adequate training to do some of those initial, like, as people are calling, um, looking for resources, they could f help fill out intake forms and and make, you know, possible connections with landlords or just gathering the documentation you might need to process, you know, those applications. Um, but another big thing with prevention for us has been, you know, creating relationships with landlords. And I think that's an opportunity for volunteers because you don't, you never know what volunteers you have that already have relationships with landlords or um, might be willing to go, you know, talk to them about family promise and, and really build that. So I do think there are ways that you can get volunteers plugged in, whether it was, you know, doing that administrative stuff or kind of going out in the community almost on, on your behalf, working with landlords. Thank you so much. And I think this next question is kind of a good piggyback off of that, which um, could, I think, Klaus and Lisa, you both could speak to, um, maybe Klaus from the national level, but what type of official partnerships exist between Family Promise um, and, for example, Feeding America or, you know, any other community partnerships that we have? Um, that's a great question, Kayla. And I'll follow up on Lisa's um, point before, too, as well, that a lot of our affiliates, you uh, you can have volunteers providing um, additional meals, right? Because families in prevention are typically struggling uh, and that creates um, also a sense of community. You also can have volunteers involved in some of the skills areas uh, like financial capability, training and tenancy and so on. Uh, and we're seeing affiliates also identifying ways just to kind of create community, right? To help um, support and, and boost up a, a family that is struggling. Um, kind of replicating what we had in the shelter model, but but having it support the family while they're in their home as well, too. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for volunteerism. In terms of, of questions for partnerships, a lot of that happens on the local level. What we've done on a national level is we've actually identified a number of great national partners. Help Us Move In, which Lisa mentioned, is a fantastic one. It's a foundation out of Washington State that supported us across the country in helping affiliates spur these kinds of programs. We've got terrific corporate partners like Clayton and uh, Clayton Homes, Ikea, uh, Synchrony Bank that have helped us with launching these programs as well. Um, in terms of services, it really is very much localized. So depending on what is needed and what exists in that community, we help our affiliates identify who those partners are. We certainly work on a national level with organizations like Habitat and Building Together and so on, but it's going to come down to the local and that's one of the, the kind of benefits and challenges for an organization like Family Promise is that we are ultimately multi-local. We have all these incredible affiliates in different areas and the nature of elements in different areas varies. So 
we try to provide them with the tools and the supports that they need to identify what's the best partnerships to foster locally. Yeah, for us, um, for locally, we have, I would say most of our partnerships come are with other nonprofits in our area that are not doing, you know, the exact same work, but kind of similar um, in figuring out, you know, exactly because for, so for us, you know, we started five years ago. So we we're one of the newer, we were one of the newer nonprofits in our area. So when we were going to launch our financial assistance program, I met with or our prevention program, I met with some of our other agencies that we work with that were already doing financial assistance to see like, you know, what, um, what gaps are they doing? What can they not um, fund? And how could we fill that gap? So that's what we've done. Well, that's great. Thank you both so much for um, answering that last question and all three of you for answering the audience's questions today. Um, that was all of the questions that we had. So I will go ahead um, and move on to the last slide and hand it back over to you all to wrap up. Well, I'll, I'll start the wrap up and I'll let Lisa and Kenya have the last words. Thank you everybody very much. Uh, understanding, you know, sharing these challenges around definition are really very, very important because again, we need to treat family homelessness as a holistic problem, as a systemic problem, not as a political problem. As long as it remains a political problem, you end up with the headlines, the perceptions, uh, the focus on chronic singles who absolutely need to have support we need to look at this as a systemic issue, as a housing issue, as a poverty issue. Um, I will turn it over to Lisa and Kenyon to have the last word. Yeah, um, thank you all again for um, listening. But I think um, one thing that always comes to mind when I'm talking about prevention and um, the work that we do and other affiliates do is I'm just really reminded how much um, that homelessness really is a situation for a lot of people and having prevention programs really allows us to, you know, step into that um, situation and really prevent it from turning into anything bigger than it might have to be. Um, so I, I would just encourage you if you're, um, you know, if your community doesn't have prevention programs to really look into it and um, see what you can do to get started. And I just want to say thank you everyone for listening to my story. And thank you all for having this because, you know, this wasn't available a few years ago. And I know it's a lot of information for someone. And um, if anyone's out there that's, you know, thinking of ways to help your community, support your community, volunteer, um, I would definitely start with Family Promise. It's a great way to get involved. And, you know, and like kind of piggyback on what Lisa says, if, you know, you have any other prevention programs or if you live in a rural area that doesn't have a lot, this would be a great way to, you know, help your fellow men. Thank you so much, Family Promise. Thank you all. I hope you have a great rest of your day.